Hello, this is Angus Song again with another installment of Authoritarianism 101. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most influential political philosophers of modern times, Karl Marx. On first consideration, it might seem incongruous to speak of Karl Marx as modern. But in spite of the fact that Marx's principal works were published over 130 years ago, and despite all of the social, political, and economic catastrophes associated with his ideas since then, he remains a remarkably contemporary and influential figure. Now we're going to consider, from a technical philosophical perspective, why Marx continues to be influential, and also why his influence has been catastrophic. Karl Marx remains influential, not so much because of his famous theories about economics and social evolution, which have been thoroughly debunked both in theory and in practice, but rather because of the enduring appeal of his thoughts about social and political morality. His moral convictions have continued to attract vast numbers of converts long after economists of every ideological hue have certified that Marxism does not raise living standards for the working class and the needy, and historians have affirmed that society does not progress inexorably from feudalism to capitalism to socialism, as Marx insisted it did. So what was it, then, that Marx said about social and political morality that so many people continue to find so attractive? And why has Marxism led to so many morally catastrophic outcomes, despite its reputation as a morally creditable doctrine? Karl Marx believed that market economics and economies based on the private ownership of the means of production, capitalism, dehumanized people by reducing all human relationships to merely economic relationships, wherein the only value that a human being had was their market value as a worker or a consumer. This, he believed, resulted in a morally brutalistic society where, if one's market value was too low, one would simply be left in society's economic ditch to die, like an old draft horse that had collapsed in its harness. In the light of this view, it's easy to understand why many would perceive Marx's moral objections to capitalism as reasonable, and be attracted to his promise of a more egalitarian society wherein economic resources would be distributed, to cite his famous phrase, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. And Marx also believed that it was profoundly unfair and unjust that workers did not own the values that their labor produced under the capitalist system, that managerial overseers who never even got their hands dirty, and distant financiers and stockholders who had never even entered a factory, had a greater claim on the wealth that the factories produced than those who actually did the producing. Such elites had no just claim upon the wealth of an industrial economy, Marx contended, but rather the workers themselves were the rightful owners of the fruits of their labor and of the industrial economy itself. And Marx was also appalled at the working conditions in the factories, and incensed at what he represented as the bare survival wages that the workers were paid. Workers were dehumanized by a factory environment that turned them into mere cogs in the machinery of modern production and low wages kept the working classes dependent upon and obedient to the capitalist classes who underpaid them and the bourgeoisie merchant and landlord classes who exploited them. Marx called upon the workers of the world to unite, take back what was properly theirs, and create a classless society in which everything was owned collectively and all values were humanely apportioned by a government of, by, and for the proletariat, which was Marx's term for the industrial working class. But why, given the seeming reasonableness of Marx's moral objections to capitalism, have his theories consistently been identified with the political malignancies of Leninism, Stalinism, and Maoism, with the institutionalized moral evil that is Soviet-style communism? How could it be that Marx's concern for the conditions of the working class and the plight of the needy could lead to such moral perversions? His defenders have insisted that tyrants like Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, and Mao Zedong twisted and abused Marx's benevolently intentioned teachings. But during this presentation, we're going to discover that the social and political immorality historically associated with applied Marxism is an inherent aspect of his philosophy, 
originating in the stratum of his thought that lies far beneath the surface of his moral pronouncements, at the level of philosophy where all speculation about morality begins, the level of metaphysics. For it is Marx's metaphysical ideas, his theories about the basic nature of reality and humanity, that contain the poisonous philosophical seeds of the social, economic, and moral calamities caused by Marxism. It is these metaphysical dogmas that have led, almost inexorably, to the moral evils associated with his system, and, we'll see, cannot lead anywhere else. These iniquities, we'll find, are simply the result of following the implication of Marx's metaphysical premises to their logical philosophical conclusions, and we'll see that nothing more is required to create an immoral society than studious adherence to the moral inferences of Marxist metaphysics. And indeed, a principal aspect of these metaphysics virtually bans moral considerations from the dominion of social philosophy. This is because Marx's famous materialist conception of social evolution is itself based on a metaphysically materialist conception of humanity that says that all human thinking about morality is mechanical, like the cause and effect processes that govern the behavior of crude matter. Human thought about morality, such as conceptions of justice and rights, mechanically reflects nothing more than the financial interests of the economic class of which one is a member, rather than any rational conjecture about morals this theory postulates. Bourgeois philosophies about justice and rights, for instance, merely echo bourgeoisie greed and selfishness, and paradoxically, proletarian pronouncements about social justice, such as Marx's own, reflect exactly the same. Nothing that anyone thinks about morality, justice, and rights bears any resemblance to an objective theory of social morality, Marx's hypothesis implies, because the metaphysically materialist aspect of his philosophy says that human beings have no volitional capacity to model their thoughts after the facts of moral reality. Rather, Marxist materialism insists, people are driven blindly to conclusions about moral issues by the sub-rational material appetites of their particular economic interest class. Moral thought is impossible, therefore, and concerns about morality are, despite Marx's posturing as a philosopher of social morality, irrelevant in the Marxist metaphysical and social universe. But the notion that all human thought about morality is illusory and irrelevant is not the only implication of Marxist materialism that subverts human efforts to build a decent society. The idea that human beings are incapable of coming to valid conclusions about political and economic justice has even more devastating implications for social and political thought. For if human beings cannot think objectively about political morality, they cannot resolve their differences peaceably through reasoned debate about what is right and fair, and so must resort to brute force to settle their disputes. And brute force was, indeed, the resort that Karl Marx advocated in the form of a class struggle between the proletariat and the capitalists that, he said, would sweep away by force the old conditions and bring about the establishment of a benevolent dictatorship of the proletariat. Although Marx insisted that this dictatorship itself would lead to the abolition of all classes and to a classless society, as a practical matter, the metaphysically materialist implication that morality is nugatory and that human beings can only resolve their differences through force does not lead to an egalitarian rainbows and unicorns moral utopia. Rather, it leads to the brutal repression of Soviet-style totalitarianism. But metaphysical materialism, as important as it was to the logical structure of mature Marxism, was not the only metaphysical idea that Marx employed as a premise for his social philosophy. When younger, Marx had experimented with metaphysical idealism for this purpose, and later incorporated a metaphysical doctrine that is usually associated with his idealism into his fully developed materialism-centric theory. This concept, which is best, but not universally referred to as organicism, says that reality is a single being or organism, and that everything in reality, including human society, is an organism as well. His integration of organismic and materialism-based social doctrines resulted in Marx's distinctive version of that most famous of all authoritarian social theories, the organic theory of the state. 
Marx's peculiar rendering of this doctrine says that the social organism, which is human society, evolves into higher and higher states of social development, from feudalism to capitalism to socialism, through the socially Darwinistic struggle of the economic classes for supremacy that is also central to the materialist component of his system. And just as Marx's metaphysical materialism creates moral dilemmas for the advocates of his theory, so also does his metaphysical and social organicism. For organic theories of society, like materialist theories of politics, are invariably and unavoidably brutalistic. They are so because organic social theories completely obliterate the reality of the individual human being, thus making the exploitation and abuse of the individual seem morally acceptable, morally normal. They do this by representing individual human beings as having the same relationship to society that a cell in a living body has to the larger biological organism of which it is part. Just as the cells or various other parts of your body do not have the metaphysical status of an individual, this theory says, but are merely parts of the larger real individual, which is you. So you do not have the status of an individual either, but are merely a cell in the true individual, which is society. The obvious implication of this idea is that because you are not really an individual, you do not have individual rights, and therefore society and the state can do whatever they want with you. And although Marx doesn't seem to have advocated this ominous inference openly, he did openly propound the organic social theory it's established on, and held the liberal theories of individual rights that are based on the metaphysical reality of the individual in contempt, calling them a pompous catalog. Later, societies based on Marxism, such as the former Soviet Union, unambiguously propagated organic theories of society and formally implemented them in practice as well. The Soviet state intellectual apparatus, for instance, openly promoted the notion that all human invention and productivity were attributable to the efforts of the single organism which is society as a whole, rather than to the efforts of individuals. And Soviet economic policy accordingly treated all wealth as though it was owned by the organic social whole that it purportedly produced it, rather than by individual inventors and workers. Under the Soviet economic system, individual Soviet citizens were denied the property rights and rights of free trade that liberal economic theory, capitalism, asserts are basic human rights. And as a consequence, Soviet citizens suffered a degree of institutionalized economic exploitation that is unimaginable, even to the severest critics of the capitalist system. But why did this happen? Why have Marx's organicist and materialist metaphysical theories, with their pernicious implications for social morality, played such a large role in shaping the practical development of Marxist societies? Why weren't these societies dominated instead by Marx's express concern for the well-being of the working class and the needy? Did those who built these societies, Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, Fidel Castro et al., simply choose to ignore the ostensibly benevolent aspects of Marx's doctrine? These are difficult questions to answer because they pertain to the hidden workings of people's private psychology and mentality. But the history of the evolution of Marxist societies seems to confirm that, in the battle for influence that occurs within the human mind, metaphysical philosophy trumps moral philosophy, so that if a doctrine's metaphysics clashes with its expressed moral postures, the metaphysical philosophy is going to win. This occurs because metaphysical theories establish the logical premises of moral theories and subvert those premises when they contradict them. So that if your moral theory says that each should receive according to his needs, but your metaphysical theory implies that individuals don't have any rights at all, you'll get a society where neither the people of ability nor the needy can make any compelling moral claim on social resources. And if your metaphysical theory says that all concepts of justice and rights are merely the intellectual waste products of the financial appetites of the various antagonistic economic classes, you will get a society run by people who have no moral compunction against establishing a totalitarian state. 
And it seems that this is exactly what happened in the course of the historical evolvement of Marxist societies. Lenin, Stalin, Castro, and Mao didn't so much betray Marx's moral vision of a kinder, gentler society, as they instead simply followed the implications of the deeper aspect of his theory, his metaphysics, to their logical moral conclusions. As to which aspect of his philosophy Marx himself hoped would prevail, we can never really be sure because of the aforementioned difficulty of divining people's private motives. But Marx's overt advocacy of the use of force to establish his new society, and the surly, snarling tone of this advocacy, seems to betray a personal moral obtusity at odds with his affectation of a soft-hearted concern for the plight of the struggling lower classes of the 19th century. In either case, it's apparent that Marxism as a comprehensive doctrine contains, as we noted earlier, the philosophic seeds of its own moral self-destruction as a prescription for human social flourishing. There is no possible, no logical way that this system can lead to anything other than moral and social catastrophe, because moral and social catastrophe are built into this theory at the deepest of all intellectual levels, the metaphysical level. This actuality probably won't prevent people from promulgating Marx's theory, for it has proven to be an extremely useful ideological instrument for subverting political and economic liberalism. And there are plenty of political and ideological miscreants who perceive an advantage in doing that. It also won't prevent the philosophically naive from falling for these snake oil salesmen's ideological pitches, because as the great P.T. Barnum reputably observed, there's a sucker born every minute. But you don't have to be one of these suckers. And now that you know exactly why nothing good can ever come of Marxism, you won't be.